you're the only person in the universe who has ever and will ever have the experiences and thoughts that you have. And so if you don't share them with the world, then those thoughts and experiences and what we can learn from that will not ever be shared. You're listening to The Creative Imposter, episode number 84. Welcome to The Creative Imposter. I'm Andrea Clunder, and as this episode rolls out, I am on my way to She Podcasts Live 2019. And the reason I'm telling you this is that if it weren't for this conference, I may never have connected with today's guest, Clara Harris. Introducing Clara is a bit like introducing myself. She is a podcaster, actor, yoga teacher, writer, basically all the creative pursuits I've identified with in the past, but talking with her was not like talking to myself, fortunately. She has had a lot of experiences I haven't, and thoughts I haven't. And we have come together because we were assigned to a panel together for She Podcasts Live called Fall in Love with Your Own Voice. At least, that's the title we came up with. And in fact, that panel is a big part of what has inspired this series on voice for The Creative Imposter. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go back right after you listen to this one and listen to the last two episodes with Davin Youngs and Rob Biesenbach. And then keep listening because we've got even more vocal perspective coming your way. If you happen to be a podcaster or aspiring podcaster attending She Podcasts Live, come see Clara and me along with Lisa Orkin and Tina Dietz for our voice workshop Friday morning at 11 a.m. And also be sure to subscribe to my other show, Podcast Envy. Next week, we'll be talking with the co-hosts of Key Change, creating opera for all voices, and we get into, well how podcasting has helped them to find new and powerful ways to use their voice that they never thought of. And whether you are or aren't a podcaster or thinking about becoming a podcaster, I encourage you to take a listen to the Yoga with Clara podcast and go back and check out old episodes of her audio drama podcast. We talk about why that one's on hold right now, Swamp Witch Studio, which she started to get over the boredom of being a new mama stuck at home feeling creatively stifled. Whether you have or have not ever been a new mama, I know that there have been moments when you have felt creatively stifled. So what did you do about it? Anyway, I don't want to tell Clara's story. I want you to hear it from her, along with the mindset tools, breathing exercises, and performance techniques for improving your confidence in your voice that she shares in this episode. Links to all things Clara Harris and resources mentioned will be linked in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 084. And you can find them in the episode description in whichever app you are using to listen. Be sure you listen all the way to the end. I'll be sharing how you can become a part of the Creative Imposter podcast for episode 100. I have an idea. Finally, you may be wondering what on earth the title of this episode means. Listen closely and you'll find out. Here is podcaster, actor, yoga teacher, writer, and coach, Clara Harris. So I am wondering from you, what are you most looking forward to at She Podcasts Live? And also, how is it do you think that you came to be on this panel on this topic? Well, what I'm most looking forward to at She Podcasts Live, I think, is just being in the vibe of all of the other women podcasters. That was the thing that was most energizing about podcast movement last year was just the energy of being in a room where everybody gets what podcasting is and why we're doing it, even though the topics that we podcast about might be vastly different. And then I've been a huge fan of Elsie for, gosh, over a decade. And so I was following her when she was still doing Elsie's yoga class. Yes. Podcast. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> and I love Jess too. I love what they have in their community and in their podcast. And so being a part of a live version of that was really exciting. And then I pitched two sessions mm -hmm. for She Podcasts Live, one of which I'll be doing on Sunday, which is sort of a yoga and creativity goal setting workshop, which is a miniature version of something that I do here in Louisville once a month. 
And then the other session that I pitched was a session on the voice, on the art of the voice. I'm glad that you mentioned podcasting, voice training, yoga, all mixed together because mm -hmm. when I look at your website and when I look at your bio, I see a whole bunch of different <laughs> things yes. that you do. And I am very familiar with this because I also have been an actor. I also have been a yoga teacher. I also have been a podcaster and an entrepreneur <laughs> and a singer and all of yep. these different things. And so I'm curious when somebody asks you what you do, how <laughs> what do you say? I thought you might be leading up to that question. <laughs> it depends on who they are and the environment that I'm meeting them. So it's funny you ask this because I've really been struggling this year with what to answer because I'm growing a yoga business. I've been certified for about a year, but during that year, a little over a year, but during that year, I've had a lot of acting work. So I've not had to develop a robust yoga business because I was robustly doing my acting business. Mm -hmm. So as I've moved into more of a downtime, and that's just the way it is really with any career, you know, you've got kind of feast and famine, but acting in particular. So as I've moved into sort of a quiet time for acting, I've had to ramp up my yoga. So I think, well, maybe maybe I should lead with, I am a yoga teacher, but I identify so much as an actor. I really struggle with, I don't know. So I've latched onto this, I'm a creative entrepreneur. And then the arrangement of other things I say kind of depends on who they are. Because I also coach acting students, primarily high school students who are getting ready to go to college or they're applying for programs like Interlochen or we have a high school performing arts school here in Louisville. So eighth graders are getting ready to do their applications for that. And there's a governor's school for the arts. So I interact with parents of young actors. They get a different spiel than mm -hmm. somebody that I'm encountering maybe at a coffee shop. So it just kind of depends. But creative entrepreneur is my anchor at this point. And how does podcasting fit into there? How did you come to podcasting? And I know the bio that you sent me, I was <laughs> chuckling because you said you were both well-versed in starting podcasts and also pod fading. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm on the struggle bus with one of them right now. So I've been listening to podcasts for a long time since the, what was the, I think they were called the Zoom. They sort of, they were basically a cheap version of the iPod. I think it was a Zune, Z-U-N-E maybe. Yes, it had the little right. wheel uh -huh. on it. Yep. <laughs> Back when we were still using Napster, uh -huh. maybe. <laughs> anyway, and more hip than hippie. Did you happen? A lot of people back in the day used to mm -hmm. listen to more hip than hippie anyway. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the wild west of podcasting. And I just fell in love with the crazy stuff people were doing on audio. So I've been an, an avid listener. And then I would dabble and I would try to do a little something that was awful. And then when I first started trying to release podcasts. I didn't know anything. What is this RSS thing? I thought I had to write that. So I started trying to learn coding to code my own RSS feed. And then I learned, oh, there are services that you just pay people and you upload the file. And so it's been a long journey and a lot of learning curves along the way. But in terms of incorporating podcasting into what I do, the one I'm keeping up with right now is my yoga podcast. And that is an extension of my marketing as a yoga teacher. Ideally, I want to be location independent so that it doesn't matter where my acting career takes me. I can have a thriving yoga business in between acting gigs wherever life tends to land me. Mm -hmm. So that's the one I am staying on top of right now. I have an occasional audio drama that is an extension of what I really love, which is the writing and the acting. Mm -hmm. And I've just fallen in love with audio drama, I think because I grew up listening to Prairie Home Companion and <laughs> my dad had cassette tapes of the Lone Ranger audio drama that he would play oh, for my brother and I and uh, lots of long car rides, lots of audiobooks. And so as I think back on it, it's a natural extension of my acting pursuits, but then it's also an inexpensive extension yeah. of my acting pursuits. It's less expensive than video and also theater because I can bring a bunch of friends over. We can read through a script and rehearse it and I feed them dinner and then we can work around their schedule and maybe record a few scenes this night and a few scenes that night. And that's not really something you can do, obviously, with live theater. You all have to be in the same place at the same time. Mm 
And with video, there's more tech involved. And then you also have the issue of what you look like. So uh-huh. people like that they can just come over and like hang out, do a little acting. It doesn't matter what they're wearing, whether or not they have on makeup. So that's one that I really love, but it is a lot of work. So I aspire for that one to be a monthly podcast. But right now it's just an occasional podcast. And then I'm on the struggle bus with one. I love to cook. So I have a cooking podcast that I have months and months of episodes recorded and not edited because uh-huh. that's the part I like the least. <laughs> so, so I'm struggling with, do I just let those go? And they're just going to be lovely experiences of me learning more about working with the mic and doing interviews and that sort of thing. Or do I just sit down and knock out the editing and make it happen. I don't know. So I'm playing around with that one, whether or not I want to let it pod fade or bring it back. So Yeah, I am familiar with wanting to start a dozen podcasts yeah. <laughs> all at once. I have two that I actively maintain right now. And a couple of years ago, on a whim, I launched a meditation and oh. yoga podcast with one episode, which is never my <laughs> advice, even to my clients. And I was so excited to do it. And I did it over like a holiday break time when work was slow. And then immediately in the new year got slammed with new clients, which was awesome. And I was like, I cannot make three podcasts. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I'm curious with the audio drama, because that's something that I have not yet tackled in my producing work, but I'm really interested in it. Where are the scripts coming from? Are you writing those or where are you sourcing them? Yeah, I'm writing them. Back when I gave birth to my son, who will turn 13 this fall, I was bored out of my mind, bandwidth issues. But anyway, when I started writing, things just kind of kept pouring out. And it's, I don't know if you've ever done Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. I have. Or if you've read The War of Art. Yes. And just showing up on the page and the creative juices just keep getting reinvigorated every time you sit down to do the work, if you just show up. So I had all of these scripts that I started working on, and that was one of the podcasts that has pod faded because Mm -hmm. as I had all of this work, I would do essays and I would do scripts. And I sold some of the essays and the scripts. I started writing monologues to do a short podcasts, and I was going to do a weekly audio drama podcast. And I would, you know, have this monologue. I would sit down, I would perform it into my blue snowball (laughs) and then edit it and upload it. And so I did that for about a year I would either do a monologue or I would do a two character scene and I would do both voices. That's not a skill I really, I don't need to be doing that. (laughs) I was listening to a BBC radio drama actor doing different voices and was flabbergasted. That is a skill I don't have and I admire. And perhaps one day I will take the time to cultivate it, but that's not high on the list right now. But yeah, so I started with a bunch of scripts and script pieces plays I had written to be live theater that I adapted for audio. But then that's also part of the reason it's so much work is because I'm writing it and doing all of the editing around the writing it and then casting it and making dinner for everybody and doing the recording and often acting on it. And then editing a drama is comprehensive because you have sound effects. And I've learned so much about, you know, there are certain things I want to lie fully so I don't have to go in and find sound effects. Mm -hmm. But then there are other things that are going to be really challenging to generate in the studio as we do it. So I will have to go in and lay those under later. Finding music that is legal to use. There are a lot of challenges. So it's just very time consuming to do, Mm -hmm. but a lot of fun. (laughs) (laughs) But a lot of fun. And so do you consider podcasting voice work? And do you actually warm up your voice before recording? I do consider it voice work. I don't have specific exercises that I do to warm up, but it's not dissimilar from how I would warm up for a live theater show, which is Mm -hmm. just making sure I'm physically warm, making sure things are flowing, making sure I'm hydrated and that I have water nearby. When I have allergies and other issues, I've got the voice steamer and then the entertainer secret spray because allergies in this area are really bad. The other thing I run into is fatigue. Mm -hmm. As I've listened back and done a lot of editing on my own voice, the fatigue is the thing that shows up most. And I get that kind of vocal fry more Mm -hmm. when I'm tired. And so I try to make sure I'm recording when I'm well rested, when I feel good and again, physically warmed up. Not that I'm necessarily like going off and doing a bunch of sun salutations, but I am making sure that I'm up, I'm moving around. I haven't been sitting at the computer for hours before I get started. Yeah. 
That makes sense. When you're working with some of your coaching clients, what are some of the common challenges or frustrations that your clients have around their voice or around performing? Nobody likes the sound of their own voice when they first start listening back to it. So that's probably the biggest thing to get over is that squeamishness, Mm -hmm. especially when we're doing on camera work to go back and watch the scene. They spend a lot of time like, oh, oh, I hate how I sound. Oh, my gosh. And more so than how they look. And then with podcasting, it's similar. It's just that squeamishness that a lot of us feel when we listen to how our voice sounds outside of our head. And that's the biggest piece of advice I give them is, look, this is how your voice sounds outside of your own head. And there are times I sit down to edit and I'm like, oh, that's my first, (laughs) you know, my initial reaction is, really, I sound like that? And I've been doing this for years. But I had a song I was working on and I could not get through a particular phrase without bursting into tears. And my voice teacher She said, you just have to burn it. And she kind of did a motion like, you know, taking a shot. She's like, just burn it. Just do that phrase. Just do it over and over and over again until you can get through it. And so I did. That was what I worked on all of that week was just that one phrase until I could get through it without bursting into tears. So similarly with my clients, we just try to burn it. It's like, we're just going to watch. We're just going to watch or we're going to listen. We're just going to get over it because... You have two options, either figure out how to deal with that squeamishness, kind of where to put it, how to Mm -hmm. cope with it, or don't do it. I suppose there are other options, but I'm maybe a little bit of a hardliner when it comes to my coaching (laughs) clients, like, get over it. It's a hard business. Come on. Yeah, I've always struggled with that, even with a performance background, watching video of myself, the Mm -hmm. worst. Even teaching yoga, in my yoga teacher training, we did uh, video reviews with our trainer where we would have a team of four and two would be teaching and then one would be videoing and one would be watching the students and taking notes to like see how the students were responding to your cues and things like that. Anything that you may have missed because you were too nervous in the teaching and cueing to actually like be looking at your students. Yes. (laughs) Whatever it is. And we would have to sit there and watch the video of us teaching with our trainer. And it was so painful. I mean, it was like the sound of your voice, the way you said things incorrectly, the way you were standing, the do I really look like that in camel pose? I'm never doing camel pose ever again. You know, like, so I think that is really common. What are some of the techniques that you work on with your clients? I know that I've heard from people, especially in the podcasting space, things like feeling like they're too monotone and they don't have enough energy and they feel like Mm -hmm. their voice is boring and nobody's Mm going to want to listen to it. I've heard things like women who are concerned that their voice sounds too squeaky or high pitched or doesn't have enough authority to it. I've heard people who never realized that they seem to be congested all the time. But when they (laughs) listen back, they're like, wow, I sound really congested. What is that? You know, Mm -hmm. what are some of the common specific challenges that you've seen? The pitch of the voice is something that I run across, especially the teenage girls I work with. In fact, I had one over the spring earlier this year. And the more we watched back her video, she was like, I sound a lot younger than I am. And she also has a younger look on camera than she does in person, which she also came to realize. And so, yeah, I definitely run into, especially with the teenagers, you know, I sound so young. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of are, but yeah, (laughs) you know, own it because that's going to make you have nice longevity in some of those younger roles. So that'll be nice. That'll serve you well. But the biggest thing I run into, again, especially with teenage students, Although this is true with the yoga students, with the adult yoga students as well. But as a performer, teenagers have a hard time knowing what to do with their bodies and they want to stand and just deliver it, which Mm. what you were saying about monotone, that's kind of what happens. And they sort of fake this emotion. It's like, I don't believe that emotion. So (laughs) once we go through the mental process of what is your character saying in this moment, now what do you do with your body when you're experiencing that emotion? So let's try that when we go back and do this monologue. And it feels so much better in their body and it sounds so much more interesting. That is probably one of the primary things I work on with every student 
for a long period of time because I don't know if you've seen Talladega Nights where Will Ferrell is doing an interview and he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. And I just <laughs> crack up at that line because it's like that is almost every student I have. And the adult yoga students are similar. You know, you'll say, and you've probably experienced this as well, you know, take your right hand and your opposite leg and reach it out for bird dog extending in the opposite direction. And they have to kind of stop and like look at their hands. And so there's this lack of awareness in their body. Well, that comes through in their voice as well. When you are trying to perform, whether that is on the mic or on stage or on camera, if you don't have a sense of presence and where you are and where these emotions are as an actor, where these emotions are sitting in your body, it's hard to make that come out in your voice because it's not coming from an honest place and it's not coming from a physical place. So that's been my experience anyway, is that vocal performance, even if it's just on the mic, is as much a physical performance as being in front of an audience on a stage. So standing up is something that we work on with microphone technique. Don't record sitting down. Are you standing right now? I can't tell. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm standing. <laughs> I can't record sitting down. I've tried it and I just don't breathe as normally, which is another thing we work with is the breath. And again, I'd prefer standing because it allows for all of the space for the ribs to expand out as well as front and back and there to be plenty of room in the abdomen so that as the diaphragm drops down into the abdomen, there's plenty of room for all of that movement that needs to happen to have good breath support. So that's a big part of what we work on as well is, is just accessing that breath, that natural breath, you know, doing that through doing some movement beforehand and recording standing up. And then it gets varied depending on whether or not you're working with a script. But the breath is probably the second biggest thing that I work on with my clients. Yeah, I totally agree. What's interesting is I record anything that is a solo episode or my intros and outros. I always record those standing, but then I always do my interview sitting. And I've tried doing interview standing and I get really antsy. <laughs> and I start like shifting my weight around and then I stop focusing on my guest. I don't know what it is about standing that makes me, I don't know, I just start getting in my own head. So I like have to sit to focus. Yeah. But I am sitting on a stool with no back to it. It is a hard wooden stool. And I also edit usually sitting on this stool because mm -hmm. for recording, I like it because it does force me to like sit up taller and mm -hmm. have more space in my abdomen and use my core muscles and yeah. connect with my diaphragm and all of that stuff. And also for editing, I get sleepy if I'm sitting in a position like sometimes I'm tempted to take my laptop and edit from the couch and I get so sleepy so quickly. And also that is terrible ergonomics. For, yeah, <laughs> for your body. And if I'm sitting on the stool, again, I'm forced to have my shoulders back. I'm forced to be more upright. Mm -hmm. And I notice more quickly if I'm starting to like get fatigued and my posture is shrinking. Yes. But I like yeah. what you say about this being like a physical activity, because I do think that a lot of podcasters and especially new podcasters think that it's about just sitting down and talking. Mm hmm. And unless they've come from a performance background of some kind, they don't necessarily always have an awareness of what goes into bringing more energy into their recordings and into mm -hmm. their conversations, even if it is a casual conversation with friends or <laughs> right, you know, right. that style. What are some of your favorite breathing techniques to do with people who maybe have never done any breath work before and are like, don't you just breathe? <laughs> so I have two that are my go-to. The first is the three-part breath. So we just learn without going through the whole exercise itself. Basically, you start by thinking about drawing the breath all the way down into the belly and work on that and just notice bringing your breath deep into the body. Then you work on breathing and expanding the ribs out to the side. So if you put your hands like right underneath your armpits and as you inhale, think about expanding the ribs outward, which is kind of an awkward place to put your hands, but connecting with that sensation, getting that kinesthetic sensation of the ribs also expand outward. It's not just about belly breath, which my voice teacher and I have lots of conversations about how that's often taught incorrectly, but that's neither here nor there for this purpose. For singers or for yoga? Primarily for singers. 
there are some things that have been taught over the years that for contemporary musical theater singing and contemporary pop singing don't really serve your voice and creating the sound that you need. And it creates tension in the belly and in your breathing apparatus, which then creates tension in the voice. And so then you can't produce the sound you need to produce that's forward and bright and all of this business. But yeah, so connecting with the breath into the belly and, and just noticing that when you breathe in, your belly has some movement and then connecting the breath to the movement in the ribs and then connecting the breath to the movement in the chest right under the collarbones. So I might do this with somebody lying down and they put their hands on their belly and take a few breaths there and then kind of grasping their ribs and take a few breaths there and get that sensation of the ribs expanding out like, oh, what are those the bellows? Um, mm-hmm. That, you know, you or you might use to pump up a fire, you know, the squishy air thing. That's the official term, the by the way. Thing. <laughs> yes. And then you move your hand up to your heart center. So right underneath your collarbones and get a sense because our lungs go all the way up there. And so get a sense of the expansion that happens there when you breathe in. And so we're not really like forcing strong, like, you know, we're not breathing like that. We're just noticing when we're breathing naturally, we're trying to bring the attention to these areas moving. And then you start coordinating all three of them moving as you breathe in and out. So that's one thing just to connect that your whole torso is engaged when you're breathing. And so being able to relax the low back, being able to soften the shoulders, And actually, I have to make sure I am releasing my glutes. I have a tendency to really Mm. tighten up my glutes when I start warming up in my voice lesson. She's always like, release that low back, release that low back. It's actually the top of my gluteus maximus that's like, oh, no, that's actually where I need to be releasing. That's the butt muscles for for anyone who's (laughs) not familiar with the anatomical terms here. (laughs) And they connect right at the top of your pelvic bone. And so that's where I carry some tension when I start thinking about breathing when we start doing our vocal warm ups. So that's a tendency I have noticed. And that's so much of it is just noticing some of these tendencies that you have, which goes back to getting accustomed to the sound of your own voice and working on editing. You start to notice habits that you have, like saying um a lot or certain tongue clicks, or in my yoga podcast, I notice I tend to talk in sort of three word phrases. (laughs) It's the yoga teacher voice. (laughs) Exactly, exactly, which in person works fine. Or I'll sort of talk and then I'm searching for a word Well, when you're just listening to the audio and you don't see me, you're not in the room to feel that energy of, oh, she's just looking for the word. It sounds like, wait, what's the end of the sentence? What's the end of the sentence? So you start to notice some of those tendencies, which can help getting back to the breathing. If you notice where you're holding your tension, then you can just give a little love to that area when you get to the mic. Mm -hmm. The other breathing exercise I use a lot is a square breath. So you breathe in for three and out for three or whatever your count is. And then after a few rounds like that, then you start to notice the pause at the top of the breath and the pause at the bottom of the breath. So there's this suspension. After we notice that, we begin to lengthen it. So it's in, two, three, pause, out, two, three, pause. And then you begin to extend that pause for two counts and then finally three counts so that you're breathing in for three, suspending for three. Mm -hmm. breathing out for three, suspending for three. So those are the two go-to breathing techniques that I use for a lot of my clients because it helps them get into their bodies, get more familiar with where the breath is coming from, begin to connect with where they're holding tension. And then also that square breath exercise is a good way to calm the whole system down so that you have something to do with those nerves. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of it is, honestly, it's a babysitter for the brain. So when we get nervous, it's all up here in the mind. And so if we can give the mind something to focus on besides how nervous we are, then the breath can begin to cooperate with us and we can give the performance we need to give. I like that because it also brings it back to what you were saying about intention and about knowing what you want to communicate and how the authentic movement or hand gesture comes from this real feeling or real Mm -hmm. desire to communicate something and then allowing that authentic intention to come through and allowing the movement to happen allows more vocal variety Mm -hmm. naturally so that you don't have that monotone, I'm sitting on my hands trying not to move while I talk into the mic 
kind of <laughs> experience. Yeah. And I think that working from that place of intention also has to do with what we talk a lot about on the creative imposter, which is this idea of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and how sometimes it's not the sound of the voice that is tripping people up as much as it is well, who's really going to want to listen to what I have to say? Yep. Have you come across that feeling either in your own work or with anyone that you work with? Um, Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all struggle with it, but none of us, especially in this Instagram world, like to talk much about it. But yeah, especially as an actor, I didn't go to school for acting. And so that sometimes can really catch me like, who am I to be sitting here helping these college kids get ready to go off to conservatory when I didn't even do that? Well, there's more to it than that. But the long and the short of it is, is I, I actually have an English degree. But my script analysis is absolutely on point. <laughs> <laughs> and so... I run into it a lot when, because I do stage and voiceover audiobook and film, and so excited. I got to shoot a couple of days with Mark Ruffalo earlier this year, who's the Hulk, if that's not a name that rings a bell. He's the Hulk <laughs> in the most recent Avengers series. Although it's funny, when I told people I was going to be shooting with Mark Ruffalo, they were like, oh, I loved him on 13 going on 30. I'm like, oh, funny. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> it's been a while since that movie came out. But when I'm on set with a, especially with a big name like that, it's like, who am I to say I'm an actor? Because, I mean, you're an actor. Like, you've been in serious movies. And yet, we are both on this same set together. I am in this serious movie with you, even if my role is smaller. But yet, man, I'm really on the struggle bus with that a lot of times because it's hard to walk into a, a situation like that and feel like you really deserve to be there. When you do, I mean, I went through the audition process, you know, the right. the director and the producers signed off on me doing this role. And yet there is still that sense of, are you sure you guys really want me here? I mean, I could just, <laughs> yep, I'm just going to do my thing now. But then once they say action, I'm good. But it's all of the like giving myself a little talk in the car before I get out when I get to set, giving myself a little talk in the trailer like, OK, they are just regular people. They are just regular people but they're so cool, but they're just regular people. <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely something I struggle with in a variety of ways, but primarily as an actor is where I run into it most frequently. And even when it's not a big star, I mean, I've got friends that went to Carnegie Mellon and, you know, were classmates with Josh Gad and Josh Groban. And I have one friend that went to Juilliard and was a classmate of Adam Driver. And so even my friends that I work with, I do shows with here in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's like, oh, but I didn't go to Juilliard, but I didn't go to Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> but yet we're in the same show, you know, so it's something that I find to be a constant struggle, honestly. Yeah. So you have your mental pep talk. <laughs> yes. In the car on the way in. <laughs> yes. Any other tools or tricks or techniques that you use to sort of get over that? Or is it really just a matter of like, get over yourself, Clara? <laughs> well, it depends on the situation because there are other situations. Those are just the easiest to talk about because I'm not paying you to be my therapist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're also sort of the easiest kind of, I think, to communicate how frequently it comes up in this profession. But the talking to and getting your mindset right, a lot of that comes out of cultivating a meditation practice that not that I'm sitting in the car going, oh, llama, 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 which is how my son <laughs> thinks that a, a meditation goes. <laughs> it's like, well, OK, maybe not. But <laughs> there is sort of getting your mind wrapped around it. But when I get nervous about especially the yoga workshop can be kind of intimidating, like these people have paid a lot of money and they're going to be in this room for several hours with me telling them things about yoga. Who am I to be doing this when they yeah. could be going to whoever fancy yoga person that I admire? And so it's like, no, you've done your work. You know, you've done these classes. So that's part of the mindset talk, but kind of going through like, these are the things that I have done to prepare myself to be in this position to share this information with them. But then it's also a matter of, I am not there to be a guru mm -hmm. in any situation. I am there to share with you what I have learned so far on my journey in life, which is different than the journey that you have taken. And so I have some information that you don't have. And I'm going to share that with you, but I'm not going to pretend to be the world's most ultimate authority on any of this. I'm the world's most ultimate authority on my own experiences and what I have learned out of those experiences. And hopefully what I can share with you is valuable and helps you as you go on your own journey and have your own experiences. So when I can flip over into that mindset, that's primarily as an instructor, it's a lot easier than to 
take that deep breath and then go in there. There's also some faking it till you make it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just going to like take a deep breath. I'm going to put the smile on and I'm going to go do the whatever it is that I've planned to do, whether that's meeting with somebody that's a potential client or a potential partner or something. Sometimes that can be a little nerve wracking. And it's like, well, who am I to partner with this person? It's like, well, mm -hmm. just take a deep breath, smile. You are prepared for this meeting. Go do the meeting. Whatever happens is going to happen, and you can't control what they think of you. So fake it till you make it. I don't know that that's terribly helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. And I hate that phrase so much, the fake it till you make it phrase. Yes. Like, yes. I both understand and agree with it and also hate it at the same time because yes. I think that most people who use that phrase actually are not faking it at all. <laughs> That you're like tricking yourself into thinking that you're faking it to take the pressure off <laughs> in some way. That's a very and astute observation. That's my feeling about it. I remember the first time that someone ever introduced me to a group of people as an expert on something. <laughs> and I freaked out in the moment. I was feeling completely fine. They were doing the introduction. And then they said, Andrea is an expert on blah, blah, blah. And my whole body just like went whoop and tensed up. And I was like, yeah. an expert? Oh, God. Oh, God. Don't say an expert because now they think I know everything. <laughs> and now yes. they're going to expect so much more from me than what I had prepared, which was definitely not expert level. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but then I'm reminded of the saying that an expert is just somebody who knows more than the person to whom they're conveying it mm -hmm. on a particular topic. And it doesn't matter how much more you know, you could know one thing more and that still technically qualifies you as an expert. So I've since learned to try to own that title a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because you said, you know, your whole body tensed up. Yeah. And so that's a big part of what I work on, not only with the students using their body as the teenage clients that I have, using their body to perform more, but then my yoga clients as well, just being more familiar with what your body is doing and what your body is feeling so mm -hmm. that when you have those moments and you feel that tension, it's like, okay, I'm experiencing this. I am not tense. My body is tense in these places because I'm feeling this. We're going to you know, breathe. We're going to say this is an, an emotion that's going to pass. We're going to smile and deal with it because we don't have any other option. We're standing in front of a crowd of people and we have to go on stage or whatever the case is. But yeah, that sense of learning what your body's doing in the moment, especially when you're trying to deal with the nerves, is a big part of what I work on with clients. You've given a lot of good tips and techniques and thoughts around mindset and intention. Is there any other piece of advice that you have for somebody listening to this who either is already creating content, whether that be video, audio content, et cetera, or who wants to get into it, but is still feeling a little bit nervous about how it will be received or about how their voice will come across and is just a little hesitant about that piece? Well, the biggest thing is you're the only person in the universe who has ever and will ever have the experiences and thoughts that you have. And so if you don't share them with the world, then those thoughts and experiences and what we can learn from that will not ever be shared. So know that what you have to offer is valuable because simply you are and you have these thoughts and experiences and it will be valuable to your people, whoever those people are. I think sometimes people can get a little hesitant to share because they see these shows and, you know, thinking in terms of podcasting, they see these shows with huge audiences and think, well, who am I to share with a huge audience like that? And the fact of the matter is when you get started, your audience is not going to be that big. And so one way you might overcome it is, well, nobody may even hear this anyway, so I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> So that is one way you could maybe like fool yourself into just getting started. But primarily knowing that you being you is valuable and you're not going to find your people until you get your voice out there. And then in terms of consistently creating content and working on having a more engaging vocal presence on the mic, the trick that I learned doing voiceover work, which is very different than podcasting because, you know, you've got 30 second commercials. So there's a lot of, hey, come on down to get it. There's a lot of energy that you have to put into it. But what I learned doing voiceover, like commercial voiceovers, is that I have to approach that performance as though I am on camera. So with the same amount of energy. So even if you are just 
doing a show where you're talking to a friend. When you're sitting at a coffee shop talking to a friend, you're not just sitting there talking like this. And we're just going to share. Yeah. Well, so I went down to, you know, whatever story <laughs> you are talking to them about. Oh, then this happened. And oh, my gosh, can you believe? So sometimes you have to, I even will close my eyes sometimes and really try to put myself in an actual place, looking at an actual person so that I can get that vocal performance I need. If that is something that as I listen back to something that I've recorded and I feel like the performance isn't quite where I want it to be, that is a quick tip I have found that just mentally sort of like visually put yourself in a place talking to a real person not talking into a mic, not talking to a nameless crowd of people, but in one place talking to one person. And usually what you get is an honest performance. My voice teacher in Chicago, when I first moved to Chicago and I was transitioning from doing primarily classical voice training and opera, mm -hmm. and I was trying to relearn how to sing musical theater and do musical theater yes. from that world. Been there, done that. <laughs> this specific teacher who was recommended for that. My voice lessons suddenly were less about the singing and more about the acting. And mm. what you just said, I would prepare, like work and work and work on this piece and bring it to my lesson. And I would be like so confident and I would start to sing and he'd stop me within seconds and say, nope, who are you talking to? Mm -hmm. Where are you? What do you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Because I, you know, completely forgotten all of that stuff. And I was yes. thinking about the notes and I was thinking yes. about the technique and I was thinking about the legato and I was thinking about all these things. And I was not talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. that moment, you've lost the connection and mm -hmm. you're not communicating anything. And so mm -hmm. I, I love what you say about like sometimes just putting yourself in a place and speaking to one specific person. My favorite thing is podcasters. And I've done this. So I'm going to say when we are like, hello, listeners. <laughs> like, who are listeners? Like, yeah. who are you talking to? I don't know who those people are. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's funny. My last question for you is, is there anything else that you want to say that we didn't talk about or that is coming to your mind that is important to share? I think the biggest thing is just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay and go for it because, I mean, the other option is to not do it. And going back to that physical sensation that you get in your body, when you think about not doing the podcast and not getting your voice out there, how does that feel physically? And I will speak for myself. I know when I think about, okay, if I decide it's just not worth it, I'm just not going to do X, Y, or Z, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to stop this because I just, I'm not getting the traction on it that I want or whatever. Usually that felt, that gut instinct is going to let you know what to do next. And especially for those of you who might be starting out, as you sit with, is this too hard to do? Maybe I just shouldn't bother. How does that feel to say, I'm just not going to do it and kind of put that idea on a shelf? There might be a flood of relief, but my guess is if you've spent enough time to find this podcast and listen and learn all that you have already learned, you are already so far down the road of getting started, or if you have already launched, you have already learned so much more and grown so much as a person that my sense is there is a value to you and to the people who will listen to you that is worth taking the leap and being a little scared. Ooh, Clara is not the first creative imposter guest to mention fear. In fact, within this series on voice, she's not the first. I'm starting to wonder if fear is actually such a bad thing or a necessary thing. Anyway, please connect with Clara. All the links are in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 08. Four. And if you'll be at She Podcasts Live this weekend, come see us. Besides the Fall in Love with Your Own Voice panel, Friday morning at 11 a.m., Clara is also leading a session called Creativity and Dreams, a self-discovery workshop for goal setting. Sunday, October 13th at 12 o'clock noon in the PRX room. And I will be in the coaching corner and at the Ask Me Anything editor's booth several times throughout the weekend to answer questions and offer advice on podcasting for free. 
Also in the show notes for this episode, you will find a link to a list of all of the episode titles of my interviews on The Creative Imposter going all the way back to episode two from October 2015. What? Yes, this show as of this month is now four years old. And each and every interview episode has a title that starts with a verb. And it's a command or a suggestion for you as a creative, not an imposter. Did you ever notice that? Did you also ever notice that I have never repeated a verb? Yes, that is also intentional. So I have compiled all of these very intentional title actions scripted to help you live a more integrated, authentic, satisfying, rewarding, creative life and work style, all based on the wisdom that I have gained from our guests. And here's my idea to celebrate episode 100, which at this rate should come out finally in May of 2020. I want to hear from you. This is the piece that I feel has been so missing from the creative imposter, which is finding ways to get you, my listener, my audience, my community member on the show. I want to hear your voice and I am giving you plenty of time. I want you to pick one of these instructions, one episode title that resonates with you or has meant something to you over the years and tell me about it. It could be the episode itself, or even if you have never listened to that particular episode, and you should probably do that, but if you haven't, and it's just the phrase or the action verb that resonates with you, you can record a short story or voice memo and send me the audio file or you can write it out for me to read, your choice, try to keep it under six minutes or less, and I will find a way to share it as part of The Creative Imposter. If you decide to record your voice, my favorite way for you to connect, don't worry if you mess up. Just pause, take a deep breath, and keep going. I'll edit it for you. Magic. Once you have either written or recorded your story about how that episode title or that episode has resonated for you, email me the audio file or the text to andrea at thecreativeimposter.com with the subject line episode 100. Again, that's andrea at thecreativeimposter.com subject line episode 100. 100. Remember, it may take a while because episode 100 isn't coming till spring, but I want you to start thinking about it now. This episode was mixed as always by Edwin Ruiz of Mondo Machine. Our theme music is by Jovia Armstrong. I want to thank you so much for listening. And this week, I am inviting you to face your fear. Take a deep breath and just burn it over and over again until you get it.